Now that we know all of the most important physical effects, and we know what good quantum numbers are and how to find them, we can start to talk about selection rules and the spectra that come from them. But first, before we do that, I'm going to introduce a compact notation in order to describe all of the relevant good quantum numbers for a particular atom. And these are known as atomic term symbols. So the general structure for an atomic term symbol will look like this. And then we'll go through each of these in turn. So atomic term symbols are really flexible ways to write down all of the relevant information for spectra for all atoms, not just for hydrogen. And so for the hydrogen atom, this might feel a little bit redundant, but there is all of this flexibility built into the term symbol to be able to also describe things like the spectra of a krypton atom. Okay, so it starts with this list of orbitals here. And this will be something like, you know, 1s or 2p and so on for the hydrogen atom. But for larger atoms, this would actually be a longer list because you'd have many more electrons. And the next big piece is this capital L here. And this capital L will be a symbol that corresponds to the sum of all of the angular momentum of all of the orbitals that you find in this list up here. For the hydrogen atom, there will only ever be one because there's only one electron. And so this would be a lot simpler. And now this will just be the capital letter version of whatever is going on down here. All right, so if this is an, an s orbital, then this L will be capital S. If it is a 2p or 3p orbital, it will be a capital P, a capital D, and so on. But I want to point out that for many electron atoms, this capital L includes contributions from every single electron. So in those cases, this capital L will not be exactly the same as just one of these here because this includes the effects of many different orbitals. Okay, next we have in the lower right corner of this symbol, so as a subscript to the right of it, we're going to write the J quantum number. And then finally, as a superscript preceding the letter, you get this G up here, and this is the spin multiplicity. Okay, so the multiplicity is also known as the degeneracy. And so for the hydrogen atom, where we have just a single electron, the degeneracy of the spin system is always two, right? S equals one half for a single electron, which means that the degeneracy is two times one half plus one, which is equal to two. And we call that a doublet, right? So there are two states that come together, so that is a doublet. If the spin multiplicity were one, it would be a singlet. If it were three, it would be a triplet. Or for four, it'd be a quartet. For five, it'd be a quintet, and so on. But because we're just dealing with the hydrogen atom by itself, that only has one electron, it will always be a doublet. So you always have a two here. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more concrete by writing out the atomic term symbol for the ground state of the hydrogen atom. So we know that the lowest lying orbital corresponds to an n value of n equals one. And there's only one possibility there for these quantum numbers. There's just the 1s orbital for the n equals 1 state. And so we start off with the orbital list is just 1s. Because we only have one occupied orbital, the sum of the angular momentum for each of these orbitals will then just will correspond will then correspond to capital S. And because this is a single electron, we always have a doublet here, so we put a 2 up there. Now to find the subscript that comes after the symbol, we need to know what the j quantum number is. And here, remember from the last video, if you add up a spin equals one half angular momentum to an L equals zero orbital angular momentum, the only possibility for this 
is a j equals one half value. Okay, so this is the atomic term symbol for the ground state of the hydrogen atom, where we have that it's the 1s orbital that is occupied. We have total angular momentum that corresponds to a capital S, a spin doublet, and a j equals one half quantum number. Now let's keep going with this a little bit and write out all of the possible atomic term symbols that correspond to the n equals two level. Okay, so this corresponded to n equals one. So now let's figure out what are the possible atomic term symbols we can see for n equals two. And now we, now we know there will only be two possible sets of orbitals. They will either be the 2s orbitals or the 2p orbitals. So let's start with the 2s. Okay, so if we have a 2s orbital, then we know that capital L will still just be an s. J will be one half for the same reasons and we always have a doublet. So this is the state that we get for the 2s orbital. Now for the 2p, we will write down that we have 2p as the orbital that's involved. Because p has an l equals one value, this gives us the capital P for the letter. And we always have a doublet when we just have a single electron, and so this part is easy. And now what's, what's left is we have to figure out what the j value is, but here is where it's different, right? So because we have L equals one, and we are coupling this to a spin with S equals one half, it means that we have two possible values of J, right? So we either have L minus a half or L plus a half. And in this case, that gives us J equals one half or j equals three over two. Okay, so notice that we've written three distinct atomic term symbols that correspond to the n equals two principal quantum number. And the energies for these three different possibilities will all, it turns out, be slightly different, really ever so slightly different. And we'll look at a, at a table to see some detailed features of this, of this in just a moment. But for now, we we'll recognize that this implies that we have three states here. And if you look at the, all the possible transitions that go from n equals two to n equals one, that might imply that you'd expect to see three different lines. You'd expect to see one line that corresponds to the 2s one half to the 1s one half, another line that corresponds to the 2p one half to the 2s one half or the 1s one half, and a third one that corresponds to the 2p three halves down to the 1s one half. But remember that we kicked off this whole section on the spin orbit coupling and the, and the reason that we need to look at it by starting by saying that this transition from the n equals two down to n equals one is actually a doublet. So there are two closely coupled lines, not three. And so to figure out which of these lines we will actually be able to see, we need to know what the selection rules are. And so luckily now that we have these compact ways to write all of the relevant quantum numbers, we can write down the selection rules pretty cleanly. And the, the selection rules are these. Okay, so the three selection rules are that the total angular momentum must change by one, the total spin cannot change, and the total angular momentum must change by one, or so long as j is not equal to zero, a delta j of zero is also allowed. So this is basically if j changes by one, this is allowed, or if j doesn't change and j is not zero, then it would be allowed as well. So we can look at these three possible transitions that we wrote and then figure out which ones would be visible and which ones wouldn't be. So if we go left to right, so the first thing we look at is what's happening with the first selection rule, which is delta L. Okay, and so this is going from an S state to an S state. So this is L equals zero to L equals zero. Delta L is equal to zero. And based on the first selection rule, that means that this would not be visible. 
And so we can just strike that out, right? So this will not be a visible transition. Now if we go to the next one, we can go step by step through the selection rules again. This is going from a total angular momentum of P to S. So this is L equals one to L equals zero, or it represents a delta L equals minus one, which is allowed. You're going from a doublet to a doublet, which means that you have delta S is equal to zero, and therefore this is allowed. And you're going from J equals one half to J equals one half, which means that your delta J here is zero, but the J itself is also not zero. So J is one half, it's not zero, which means that this will also be allowed. Okay, so this transition based on all three of the selection rules will now be allowed. And then finally, we start at the end. So this is again a P to S. And so this is again a delta L equals minus one and is therefore allowed. Delta S is still zero. And so this is also allowed. And now finally, we have a J equals three halves to a J equals one half. And so this corresponds to a change, a delta J of minus one, right? Going from three halves to one half. Uh, and so therefore, this part is also allowed. And so that means that these are the two transitions that you could possibly see in the atomic spectrum that correspond to going from the doublet P one half to the doublet S one half, and also going from the doublet P three halves to the doublet S one half. Okay, so now let's take a look at some real data. Okay, so this is reference data for the atomic energy levels compiled by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a federal agency and also a physical sciences lab that really performs an amazing service by compiling reference data like this, including things like conversion constants and physical constants. And let me take a brief aside rule here to just express my gratitude to NIST and to the federal structure that makes things like NIST possible. Because in reality, this is an amazing service that I think is overlooked far too often. Okay, end of rent. So now let's take a look at the two allowed transitions that we're seeing from 2P, right? And so to figure out what energies these transitions would come at, you need to look at the energy of this symbol and then subtract it from the energy of this symbol, right? So you would see two different lines here. And the first line you would see would be the energy that corresponds to the 2P doublet P one half term minus the energy that corresponds to the 1S doublet S one half term. And now to find these energies, you can look over in the table here. So it starts off with the configuration. And again, because these are single electron atoms. These are all really simple. They just list a single orbital. But up at the top, you see that the one, you see the 1s and then the 2p, the 2s, uh, and then these like aggregate two. So this is sort of an average, this two is sort of like an average value that corresponds to all the different twos. And on this table, you see this listed up to four, but also in the modules, you can find a table that's ripped straight from the NIST website that uh, includes basically all of the data that NIST compiles, which goes up to like n equals nine or something like that. And so all of this data is available to you. Okay, and now you see in the next column, if you look over here, this gives you the uh, the multiplicity and the L value for the term symbol. So this is a 2s here, and then you go on to the 2p, and again, 2s, 2p, 2s, 2d, and so on. And the third column shows you the different j values, right? So you have, for 2s, you only have a j value of 1 half. And this energy is called the zero. So this is just sort of a definition for everything else that's coming, coming later. This is like the zero point energy. For the doublet p, you have j equals one half or j equals three halves. And if you look at these two, you'll see just ever so slightly different energies, right? So 
If you look at the singles place, this is where the first time that they differ. And if you just, if you actually look at how different they are, it's actually about 0.3 wave numbers. So this number is 82,000 wave numbers. These are all wave numbers. And the difference between these is about 0.3 wave numbers. But you should also take a look at the uncertainty in these. So the uncertainty in these measurements, again in wave numbers, is down to the seventh decimal point. Okay, so these differ in the first decimal point, basically. But there's still six more decimal points of really high accuracy. And so even though these two are really slight, they're only slightly different, these are extremely precise measurements. Um, so, so these differences are way above the accuracy threshold for these measurements. And so these are really good known values. Okay, so then to figure out what the transition would be, you would look at, so you would take this, you take the energy that's for the doublet P one half, which is this guy right here, and then you subtract it from the energy that's for the doublet S one half, which is this one here. And so this tells you that the first transition is this value here, which, and I would also tell you now that the partner for this, which corresponds to the energy difference between the doublet P three halves minus one S doublet S one half, which would be this. Okay, so now with that, we actually know just about everything we need to know to construct all hydrogen spectra. The only complication is what to do about a magnetic field and exactly how the splitting for those work. And we will talk about that in the next video.